Okay, <clears throat> video number two for the day. Um, we're going to talk about a retreatment uh, case that ended up not being savable. Um, you may have some qualms already about this x-ray, tooth number two, um, but let me take a step back and talk briefly about retreatments. Um, generally, I don't have problems doing my own retreatments. Almost all teeth that will need a retreatment on a root canal, I will attempt. Um, now, oftentimes we'll come to a situation, often I'd, I'd say maybe one in 20 times, I'll come to a situation where I have to stop and either refer to a specialist with a microscope or uh, tell them that the tooth doesn't seem retreatable or fixable based on whatever we find on the inside. Um, but I would not suggest retreating a root canal without some additional training. You know, I haven't been to any special residencies, I'm not a root canal specialist. Um, I've been doing root canals for, you know, since 2000 six when I graduated dental school um, and I've I've had some advanced training and lecture courses at CE and stuff <clears throat> and I'm fairly comfortable doing most retreatments but uh, be cautious be judicious in the cases that you choose you want to make sure that whatever you end up choosing for the patient it ends up being a, long, a good long-term outcome so let's talk about this case a little bit um, so this was uh, one of my associates um, at my office actually my partner um, had asked me if I would consider retreating this and I said sure I'd be happy to take a look at it and I'm always cautious with um, talking with a patient about success rates beforehand <clears throat> you know not every root canal or every retreatment on a root canal is going to yield a good outcome and I want to make sure they know that going into it so that if I have to stop take a step back uh, change directions then they're prepared for that it's always easier to pave your way than it is to you know deal with the well you promised this and this is what's happening so prepare the patient for the worst and then hope for the best you're always better over delivering than under delivering and over promising so numb the patient up <clears throat> um, one other thought I always 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 on a retreatment recommend a new crown um, you know statistically if I'm recalling this right the most common reason that a tooth needs a a retreatment on a root canal or that a canal root canal becomes reinfected is because of coronal leakage um, whether that's from a filling that's been placed in the can in the root can in the crown after the root canal or the crown itself is leaking I always recommend a new crown so just like on a molar the root canal comes with a crown in a package a root canal retreat always comes with a new crown in a package and if they're unwilling to do that um, then generally speaking, I'm, I'm not going to be comfortable doing a retreatment unless they're willing to redo the crown um, because of the potential for coronal leakage. Anyway, so once we did get this crown off, there was some decay, and I'm not sure if we can see it in the other pictures, but I'll, I'll try to show it to you. So <clears throat> she presented with a fistula, and this is the gutta percha cone running up, pointing toward the palatal root there um, through that little fistula. So here's the panoramic x-ray all this is you know looks like significant bone loss and this tooth this area right here the tooth excuse me is a post uh, but when we go back and look at that first x-ray you see this right here this is gutta percha um, and come to find out later on the dentist who had initially done this root canal um, placed gutta percha directly in an area that had been perforated in between the roots and I'll show you a photo of that um, but it looked a little hinky to begin with. Um, and you'll also, you can kind of notice this, the access, if you follow this, this is generally the access where the dentist attempted that root canal. Um, and the mesial buccal root canal is actually up in here, so they didn't actually find the mesial buccal root. So, let's go forward. Here's what I found when I got inside the tooth. <clears throat> so, let's see, this is the distal buccal root canal. This is the mesial buccal root canal um, and the access before was stopped roughly right here and you can see this is actually the perforation right there. That's where the dentist had th thought and, and I'm reading too much but this is where the doctor had thought that the canal was and actually opened a little bit. Um, so the access stopped right here. They didn't go mesially enough to find this canal and I dug around a little, a little bit here looking for a mesial buccal too. This of course is a post and I just started to dig around it with an ultrasonic, um, but this is a post here. Um, same tooth, you know, just a little different angulation. Um, this is composite. 
Um, so the doc before had, had, I think, I didn't take all this out, but I think the doctor had perforated distally as well and placed composite to cover that. But they had placed gutta percha down in this perforation spot uh, in hopes of, I'm assuming, um, uh, you know, being able to salvage the case. But here you can clearly see that mesial buckle 1 canal. Um, it's potential there's a mesial buckle 2. Once I discovered the perforation and the size of the perforation, we ended up scrapping it and deciding the tooth was not fixable. <clears throat> but that being said, yeah, it's, it's too far gone to save. Uh, personally, I wouldn't even recommend going any further because of the amount of bone loss that's in her intercercally. Yeah, so here's the perforation, pretty substantial perf. Um, so what I did um, is I actually sat back, I sat the patient up, I took my mask off, my gloves off, slid my chair around in front of her, you know, and I said, so here, here's where we're at. You know, I've discovered that there's a perforation in this tooth um, based on the amount of bone loss and what's coming out of the area in between the tooth and how mobile the tooth is. I know we had a two plus mobility. I don't think the tooth is long-term saveable. Now, if it had been a first molar, maybe we would have tried to repair that with MT, <clears throat> MTA and, you know, potentially looking at a root amputation and all that stuff, depending on how things went. Um, but she was, she was just ecstatic that she didn't have to pay for all that stuff, you know, the retreatment of the crown, but also glad because she had had some, some issues long-term with that tooth hurting and aching and being sore. So, you know, the, the perforated uh, tooth uh, floor of the, the tooth happens from time to time. I mean, I've done it a few times. Um, you just have to be really cautious when you're looking at a tooth and accessing a tooth, especially these second molars. Uh, make sure that you look at that x-ray. You know, the, the long axis of the tooth is here, um, not necessarily going in this direction like the dentist attempted to access. Remember, those, those maxillary molars oftentimes tilt backward, so they tilt backward to the distal. Um, the lower, the mandibular molars oftentimes lean forward, but the maxillary molars oftentimes tip to the distal. So you have to remember that as you're looking for access. Um, but yeah, so that's, I mean, that's the situation. You know, I stopped, of course, trying to harvest that post. Um, talked with a patient about success rates long term. You know, we, we I could definitely get a working length through here. We pull all that gutta perch out. Um, I don't remember what the working length was, but one, two, three canals, and potentially a fourth, depending on how far I wanted to dig for it. But yeah, once we discover the extent of that perforation, I mean, it's, this is probably a solid two millimeters, maybe three millimeters wide, um, going three or four millimeters down through the floor of the, the tooth. I don't think that was long-term savable. And the dentist, you can still see some of it. That gutta percha had actually been packed right there. Um, hopefully, I mean, I'm assuming in hopes that the tooth would be uh, have a, a decent outcome. She wasn't aware that he or she, whoever the dentist that did it, had perforated. Um, but that, you know, that's a, a discussion matter for another day, perhaps. You know, what, what do we do when we when we botch it like this? Is it something where you want to go and hide it, not tell the patient, hope for the best? Um, certainly, I hope, maybe she doesn't recall it, but I hope there was a discussion that there was a perforation that took place, you know, the prognosis is guarded to poor, um, but in that situation, you know, I don't think gutta perch is an appropriate seal, you know, you would have needed MTA. Now, there is some chance it had the dentist acknowledged or been aware at the time of the perforation, send the, send the patient straight to an endodontist if you're not comfortable using MTA. Have them disinfect it, dry it out real well, and put some MTA in there, and then finish the root canal. I mean, there's a good chance had that been done at that time, we could have prevented all the significant bone loss, um, and potentially salvage that tooth. Um, so those are my thoughts. You know, the, the first case from today, you know, talking about um, dealing with our own mistakes um, in a way that's ethical and making sure that we're creating a patient for life instead of, you know, creating a, a pay for the day. Um, you want to make sure that each of us uh, is focused on the patient's welfare. I, I think it's it's all too easy sometimes to focus on our production numbers that are showing up on the schedule. Um, and certainly those production numbers are important because they represent how much service we're providing to a patient, but the production numbers are not the goal, right? The goal is to create a patient for life by helping to make someone healthier and happier. Uh, and if we're doing it the other way around by focusing on production um, uh, for, for production's sake, 
um, then we got it. We got to be cautious. That that'll come back to bite us in the long run. So uh, in the end, you know, the patient was fine. Second molar, you know, she's got half of the occlusion on that. Um, upper first molar hitting tooth number 31, so she'll do just fine without that second molar. I wouldn't even recommend an implant in this situation, especially given the amount of bone loss um, that she had uh, in this area from where the root canal was failing. <clears throat> but that's all I've got for you today. Thanks again for watching. Um, always remember to focus on your patient's welfare instead of their wallet. Um, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll catch up with you later. Thanks. Bye.